Great. So I'm a practitioner of neural networks. A lot of people have probably heard that term. I'm going to actually talk to you about what that is and how you can actually be a practitioner. Um, looking at the next slide. <laughs> My timing's off already. This is a great start. There we go. So neural networks are used everywhere. You have probably interacted with a neural network implementation, a successful implementation at some point in your life. These are just a few of them. They, it can work. People have, it's gotten this bad rap over the years, but that doesn't matter. Let's look at what they are. Neural networks are biologically inspired processing models. What that means is that a machine can actually transform this thing into a piece of software that can learn functionality. Um, machine learning, that's a big, broad area. And how it relates to neural networks is you can actually take these things and you can adjust certain parameters of them and they can learn rules, they can learn logic, they can map functions, they can do all sorts of things that you really could not do without some kind of machine learning. So this is your typical neural network. It has your dendrites, your soma, and your axon. If you've ever had an introductory biology class, you probably already know this. So what's important is the artificial neuron, which is where it got its inspiration from right here. The dendrites become the inputs. The activation function in the center is representative of a soma. It's really just some kind of math function that can be differentiable. Uh, an adjustable weight, that's where the machine learning enters in. That's the thing that you actually control while you're training. And then the output is obviously how you link these things together. This is technically a neural network. You can take multiples, uh, multiple neurons, link them together. The weights in the middle there are adjusted through training. And that's how the thing can actually learn. There's automated processes that allow you to do that. So let's look at a quick example. <laughs> you're tested on this at the end. Uh, really what this is showing is a very small scale neural network. Uh, it was trained to map a function that accepts one as an input and outputs the number five. It's great. Uh, more importantly, all of these numbers in the middle here, that's what is automatically determined through training. That is why neural networks work and really other forms of machine learning. Unfortunately, neural networks have fallen out of favor in the community. That's a quote I've taken from somebody. I'm not going to name them. Uh, this really bothers me a lot being a practitioner because I use them day in and day out. I know that they can actually work. So I hope they can work or else I would be out of a job. Why did they fall out? It's important to understand the history of it. Back in the 1940s, the McCulloch Pitts Network was introduced. It was really based off of true spiking neurons. It was captured by on or off, binary signals. And you couldn't actually train the thing. It was just more of a simulation. It was fixed weights. 1950s, you have the introduction of the perceptron network. This was just an extension of the McCulloch Pitts network, but you could actually train the thing. Unfortunately, it suffered some of the same limitations because it was still used that binary signal, one or zero, which is great. 1960s, you have the Adeline network. Not much happened. 1970s, non-existent. Nothing happened at all. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it, they fell out of favor for other factors as well. Um, a lot of times, in the, if you read some of the scientific journals or some of the papers, you have exaggerated claims of success. People wanted these things to work, but they kind of fudged their data a little bit. Um, so, and let's face it, back in the 40s, computers weren't all that powerful. So you really could not do a lot of this stuff. But back propagation was introduced in the 1980s. This saved the field of neural networks. Everybody came back to it. Suddenly, you had this configurable training algorithm that was independent of the architecture that you were using. You could train it. You could put together all these different neurons together. You could, uh, and first of all, the nonlinear activation function, that's important because that drew it away from the biological plausibility, made it more of a stochastic system, irrelevant from a correct insurance sense. But just know that that's the general flow. It was not without its problems, however. And this is the most widely used training algorithm to date. However, it's slow. Algorithmically and computationally, people have problems with it all the time. If you ever talk to somebody in the academic community and they say this doesn't work, well, that's why. <laughs> However, distributed processing made easy. There are tons of open source packages that make it, you can take advantage of clustering through OpenMP or MPI. There are better training algorithms out there. Don't use backpropagation anymore. Investigate quick prop or R prop. It'll make your lives a lot easier. Finally, the training effectiveness. Let's not forget about the data. The system is only going to be as good as the data that you're passing to it, so focus on that. Filter it, investigate in some feature selection things, and ultimately, you'll have a working neural network. So finally, these things are amazingly powerful. You can use them in almost any application you could possibly think of. All that I encourage you to do is be creative, uh, really focus at it. Just 
play with them. Treat them like they're toys, not complicated mathematical models. I've run out of slides in time, so I'll just pass the microphone off. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>